Welcome to Armchair Preacher. Please open up your Bibles to 3 John. We finished 2 John last time. 3 John and number of words is the shortest book in the Bible. Number of verses is the second shortest to the first shortest is 2 John. 3 John, we said 2 John is written to believe in Israel and the Gentiles, but primarily to believe in Israel in the millennial reign. 3 John is written unto believing Gentiles in the millennial reign. So 2 John to the believing Jews, 3 John to believing Gentiles. And we'll see that as we go. 3 John 1 says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. We talked about elder. That was the same title that was given in 2 John. And we talked about how over in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, the Bible mentions that there are 24 elders surrounding the throne of God. And we talked about how that would be 12 thrones for the uh, 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel, according to Matthew 19. And then the other 12 would be for the rulers in heavenly places in the dispensation of grace, the body of Christ. So the fact that 2 John and 3 John, he starts off as the elder, where he does not do that in 1 John or in the Gospel of John or in the book of Revelation, it shows that he is already in the millennial reign and it's as his position in the el as the elder that he writes this. You notice it has the same ending in 2 John, verse 12, it says, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. Look at 3 John, verse 13. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. So both of the, both of the epistles end in a very similar manner. And the reason that the books are so short is because they are for the millennial reign. You know, if you're, say, you're in the dispensation of grace today and you want to know about sound doctrine, you can't go up to Paul and say, Hey, Apostle Paul, what did you mean when you wrote this in Romans 8? He's not here. He's up in heavenly places. We're on the earth right now. But in the millennial reign, God's kingdom is literally on earth. And John writing it to those people in the millennial reign, John can come to them and see them face to face and tell them what he meant. So he just gives the basic instructions in these two epistles and then he'll come face to face later. And I think the reason he does this in 3 John especially is because there appears to be some trouble in the church there. If you look down in verse 9, he said, I wrote unto the church. So apparently he's already written a letter to this Gentile church for the millennial reign. Um, when I say that, um, obviously the millennial reign hadn't started yet. The epistle that he wrote was probably to a Gentile church uh, during that uh, at-hand phase of the kingdom part. And it was somebody in a similar circumstance. Remember from Matthew 25, they are to bless Israel in order to be saved, the Gentiles. And that applies in the tribulation period. He says, I was a hungered, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. And I was in prison. Sick and you visited me, I was in prison, and you helped me. Those things are what the Gentiles are to do for the tribulation saints during that hand phase of the kingdom. And so I think there was a church with somebody named Gaius in it, and at the time, a Gentile church who was seeing that their role was to bless Israel, and that's what they were doing. But the problem is, there's this other epistle that he wrote, and you don't see it. We don't have it. Well, the reason there in verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, praying against us with malicious words. So you've got Diotroph Diotrephes, who is a bad guy. Verse 12 mentions Demetrius. It says, Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear a record, and ye know that our record is true. And then there's also Gaius, which in verse 1 says he is well-beloved, which means he's saved. 
So what appears to be happening is you've got this Gentile church. They, uh, they're in Israel's program during the ad hand phase of the kingdom during John's life. And he writes this epistle to them. And Diotrophes seems to be the leader of the church. And they wrote to him, but Diotrophes, because he loved to have the preeminence, received the thus not. Which probably means that he probably wrote, and then they didn't listen. So then they sent brethren uh, to this church, and Diotrophes didn't receive them. But then they saw Gaius did receive them. And you've also got Demetrius, and he has good report of all men. So there are some unbelievers in the church, but there are also believers. And because uh, Gaius and Demetrius appear to have received them, as you get later on in the epistle, you see that. Then what I think John is doing is he has the brethren. You look in verse uh, 3. He says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. So it appears what happened was that John wrote a letter to this church. Diotrophes pretty much just chunked it. He threw it away. He took over. And John says, well, we got to send some people. So he sends people there in person. And they find out that there's somebody like Gaius who, um, who is walking in the truth. And Demetrius is walking in the truth. And so it, he gets a good report. So then John says, well, now that I've got a good report, let me send another letter to them. And I'll send it not to Diotrophes, but I'll send it to Gaius. And then he can distribute it to the church. And then as long as they... Uh, heed the warnings or get in line with what I've said, then I will come to them later and give them in-person instruction. So that's what's going on. And um, I believe that there's going to be a similar thing that happens in the millennial reign. It's just like the book of Revelation. There are seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation that, are, that John writes to. And there, they must be churches that exist at that time or else he wouldn't have written to them. But then at the same time, they're going to be those churches existing um, in the tribulation period. So I think what's going on here is there is a Gentile church at the time that John writes it, and there's also going to be one in the millennial reign under the similar circumstances. So the epistle as a whole is really written for the Gentiles in the millennial reign. Um, I wrote on your outline these instructions to Gaius are probably meant to help all new Gentile believers in the millennial reign, not just that one particular church. Just like, say, for example, the book of Romans is written, was literally written to a group of people in Rome, but yet it has foundational doctrine for us today in the body of Christ. So I think the third epistle of John is the one that's written to Gentiles in the millennial reign, and while it is written specifically to Gaius, I think it is also for all, really all Gentile believers during that thousand year period. Uh, now you may wonder who is Gaius. I mention this because there are other references to a Gaius in the Bible. If you go to over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14. Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. And if you read over in Acts 17, you find out that they are rulers of the, the church there. They were actually in uh, the, Cor the Jewish synagogue in Corinth, and then they became believers. And that's why he baptized them, so they wouldn't uh, cause the Jews to stumble. But you see Gaius, so Gaius is in Corinth. And then if you go over to Acts 19, um, before we read that, you can see from Acts 18, verse 8, Crispus is identified as the chief ruler of the synagogue. Gaius is not mentioned there but I'm assuming that he is there as well uh, since he mentions Crispus and Gaius together in 1 Corinthians 1. So they're probably both there in Corinth. 
They were saved. Uh, you know they're in Corinth from the fact that First Corinthians, is, he writes to the Corinthians there, First Corinthians, and mentions Gaius by name. So he is in Corinth. And since Crispus, Gaius is mentioned with Crispus, and Crispus is the chief ruler of the synagogue, I'm guessing Gaius was also um, high up in the Jewish synagogue, but then became a Christian, believed the gospel of grace that Paul sent to him. And you see Gaius in Acts 19 and in Acts 20, when Paul goes on his apostolic journeys. In Acts 19, verse 29, they are in Ephesus. And it says, And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. So Gaius is identified as Paul's companion in travel there. And then in chapter 20, verse 4, it says, And there accompanied him into Asia, Sopator Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timotheus, and of Asia, Tychicus, and Trophimus. So again, Gaius is traveling with him. People say that these are different Gaiuses, because this is a Gaius of Derbe, and Acts 19 says it's a Gaius of, at Macedonia. Um, I think it's the same person in all cases. I think there's only one Gaius. Um, I could be wrong. I don't know geography. I'm just assuming that Derby is part of Macedonia or vice versa, and that that's all part of Corinth. That's my take on it. I don't know geography. People who do know geography, um, you know really what it was like 2,000 years ago. I don't know. Regardless if it's one person or several different people, it really doesn't matter because in all cases, the Gaius is linked to Paul's ministry. He is baptized by Paul in Corinth. Uh, he goes on a missionary journey to Ephesus in Acts 19. And he's also found with Paul there in Greece in um, Acts 20 verse 2. Uh, well, then they go into Asia after Greece, and he's found with Paul there in Asia in Acts 20, verse 4. Either way, he uh, appears to be saved in the dispensation of grace. And since John is writing to Israel's program, I think that this would be a different Gaius. It would be a different church, because if it was a... Paul would write to the Corinthians, being in his dispensation, John would only write, you know, in Galatians 2... In Galatians 2, Paul mentions that after the council in Acts 15, they decided that uh, in verse 9, in Galatians 2, 9, it says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. So James, Cephas, and John, John, uh, agree that he would only go to the circumcision. So the fact that John writes a letter to Gaius tells us that, that Gaius is of the circumcision. He is of Israel's program. And since the Gaius in 1 Corinthians and Acts 19 and Acts 20 are all of, uh, whether it's one or three different Gaiuses, they're all of the mystery dispensation, the body of Christ then this Gaius in 3 John must be different. So we can't, we can't assume anything about him from those verses. Apparently it was a, a popular name. So going back to 3 John then, so it's the elder, that's John, and to the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. And again, I believe that's Gentile believers, and we'll see that pretty soon here. Verse 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. This verse here is used by the health and wealth gospel people to say that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. Because it says right there, above, he doesn't say, well, I hope you get some money and have good health, but if you don't, it's no big deal. He says, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. Above all things, he wants him to be healthy and wealthy. And so the, the, these health and wealth gospel proponents say, you see here, God wants you to have perfect health, live to be 364 years old and have perfect health, and he wants you to have billions of dollars in the bank. He loves you and he wants to take care of you. There's a, 
red Cadillac that I've seen going to work that's in, been in front of me. And maybe if I see it again, I'll turn the camera during candid conversation so you can see it. And the license plate is a custom license plate. It says paid by JC. And I have also seen that same car come out of a church parking lot in Sunday afternoon, which tells me that this person believes in the health and wealth gospel and believes that Jesus Christ gave him that Cadillac. It's and that, like the pastor. Well, yeah, that explains why he got it, because the poor people had to give their money to the church, so they're poor. Mm -hmm. C.A. Dollar, Jesse DePlantis, um, several other of these health and wealth gospel proponents. And they use this verse. I mean, how are you going to argue against the verse? It says, I wish, not that, well, I hope you do good in business. Because, I mean, you can wish, wish that for other people. But I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. And really, this verse, all it is, because we understand the context is the money will reign, uh, it makes perfect sense for them because of where they are. Uh, first off, notice that uh, his soul is already prospering from verse 2, which tells you that Gaius is a believer. He's not like Diotrophes, who loveth to have the preeminence. Gaius is a good guy. He's a guy who believes God in his word, uh, so, or else his soul wouldn't be prospering. So again, they say, well, believers, God wants them to be healthy and wealthy. Well, it all depends on where you are. The fact of the matter is, when you look at the people who have good health and good wealth, uh, primarily, they're people who are of this world. Uh, if you look over in 2 Corinthians 4, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry... As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world is Satan, as evidenced by the fact that he blinds the minds of them which believe not. Ephesians 2.2 2 talks about how the Gentiles, or in this, in this context, it's really talking about um, all unbelievers. It says in Ephesians 2.2, 2, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So the children of disobedience and the prince of the power of the air would be Satan. The children of disobedience would be children of the devil because they are going by what Satan says rather than what, by what God says. So if Satan is the god of this world and he has a course of this world, then to get wealthy in this world, you have to follow his course. If you believe God and his word, generally speaking, you are not going to be wealthy in this world. But if Satan is the god of this world, so Satan being the god of this world, the people who are healthy and wealthy would be of Satan. So God is not going to make you healthy and wealthy today because, he, because Satan is the god of this world. He's got people going by their course. And so if your soul is prospering, meaning you are believing God and His Word and allowing Christ to live in you, then you're materially speaking, you're not prospering. Chances are. I realize there are exceptions, but chances are. Because Satan is the God of this world and he has people on that course. So when you go against that course, chances are you're not going to be wealthy. And you can see examples of this in, in Scripture. 1 Corinthians 3. You look at the Corinthians in verse 3, it says that they are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? So the Corinthians are carnal. They are not walking according to God's word. So with that in mind, go over to the next chapter, 1 Corinthians 4. 
in verse 8. And look at what Paul says. Now ye are full, now ye are rich, ye have reigned as kings without us. Okay, so here are the Corinthians. They're healthy and wealthy, according to this verse. But the reason is because they are yet carnal. They are walking according to the course of this world. Paul, in contrast, is a Bible believer and is walking according to the sound doctrine built up in his inner man. And you can see what has happened with him. In verse 10, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscurring of all things unto this day. So you see there that Paul, honoring God and his word, is suffering. But the Corinthians, being carnal, they are not suffering. They are full. They are rich. They have reigned as kings, verse 8 says. Verse 10 says that they are wise, they are strong, they are honorable. And so when you look at the world and you look at somebody like C.A. Dollar or Jesse Duplanter, so people who have made it big and they wear their fancy suits and they have all that money, and they say that God wants to bless you like he's blessed me, well, all they've done is they've walked according to the course of this world. They could still be Christians because the Corinthians were Christians. It's just they were carnal. They didn't walk in the spirit. They walked in the lust of their flesh. And so they continued to be rich in this world only because they continued to serve Satan. But if you serve God, if your soul is prospering, if you're believing God and his word and allowing the sound doctrine to come through you, you, which is what Paul was doing, you see that he is a fool, he is weak, he is despised. Verse 11 says he hungers and thirsts, he's naked, he's buffeted, he doesn't have a place to live. He labors, he's reviled, he's persecuted. He, verse 13, he's defamed. He's the filth of the word, the off, of the world, the off-scouring of all things. I mean, this, all these bad things happening to him. If God wanted, wants Christians to be healthy and wealthy and their soul prospers, then Paul would have been healthy and wealthy. But you can see he was neither healthy nor wealthy. The only ones who are healthy and wealthy are the ones who um, are carnal. I understand, you know, sometimes you, you get lucky, you know, maybe there's some multi-million dollar lawsuit that you become part of and you get all this money or you, or, you know, you hit the lottery for some strange reason or your, your family has wealth or some relative gives it to you through an inheritance. I mean, there are things that, or maybe you just have a good business idea and it worked out and you got wealthy. Um, but in general, because the only way to get wealthy is you be wealthy in this world. So to get wealthy in the world, you have to follow the course of this world. And the course of this world is set in place by the God of this world, and that's Satan. So the chances are you are not going to be healthy and wealthy. In fact, when you look over in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, People who want to know the promises of God and highlight them in their Bibles and say, I cling to the promises of God. Well, here is a great promise written by God to you. 2 Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You say, well, what's great about that? Because what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 that when I am weak, then am I strong. When I am weak in my flesh and I suffer, then I recognize that my only hope and my only strength, eternal strength, eternal hope, is in Christ. It's not in this world. And so he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities and reproaches and distress, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I glory in the fact that I suffer, because then it's the cross of Christ working through me and Christ living in me as a result. So that is a great promise that we will suffer persecution for living godly. And um, also 1 Peter 4. I wanted to mention that because we're in 3 John, which is in Israel's program, and I've been giving you passages in the Body of Christ program. So uh, to show you that I'm not just doing that, uh, look in 1 Peter 4 and 16. Peter says, 
1 Peter 4, 16. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. So, the body of Christ, we're not promised to be healthy and wealthy. Israel, in the tribulation period, is not promised to be healthy and wealthy. You can go back to verse 12 there, 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. So you see that there's the suffering for being a Christian, or there at the at hand phase of the kingdom for Israel is there. And so the fact that 3 John 2, he says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, that is another proof that this epistle is written to the millennial reign believers. If it's written to Israel, the tribulation period, they're suffering. Jesus says, think not it strange that they persecute you. They did the same to me. The servant's not above his master. He talks about that in Matthew 10. They persecuted and killed me. They're going to do that to you. Just expect that. Brothers gun against brother, father against brother, or father against son. You're going to be hated of all men for my sake, he said. Because they're going against the course of this world. But when you are in the millennial reign, Satan is not the God of this world. Revelation 20 tells us that at Jesus' second coming, God, Jesus takes Satan, casts him into a bottomless pit. And he's stuck in that pit for a thousand years. So Satan, now I recognize, you know, the policy of evil is still going on. There are rebellers, uh, there are sinners in the millennial reign, and we talked about that, especially in 2 John. But Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ in the millennial reign is sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Look over in Matthew 19. Matthew 19, verse 28. Let's start in verse 27. Matthew 19, 27. Again, this will show you when 3 John is written, or who it's written to. Matthew 19, 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Doesn't sound like health and wealth gospel to me. Peter says, I'm not healthy. I'm not wealthy. I've forsaken everything for you. What am I going to get in return? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So in the regeneration, so when Jesus Christ comes back at his second coming, he says the twelve apostles are going to be sitting on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's the 12 elders of Israel's program. They're part of the 24 elders in Revelation 4 and 5, the other 12 being for the body of Christ program in heavenly places. And remember, John writes 3 John as the elder. So he writes 3 John as one of those 12 elders sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, the positional status of Israel at the time that 3 John is written is that the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting on the throne on the earth in Jerusalem, and he's ruling and reigning over the entire world. Satan is in the bottomless pit. The beast and the false prophet are burning in a lake of fire. And all those who followed, uh, all those who followed them have been cast into hell because they've been destroyed by Jesus Christ at his second coming, according to Revelation 19. And so Satan's forces have been set aside. They've been done away, not completely destroyed, because that didn't happen until after the millennial reign, but they've been set aside. Jesus Christ is ruling the world. So the God of this world and the millennial reign is not Satan. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. When Satan is ruling, he rewards those who are on his side. When Jesus is ruling, he rewards those who are on his side. You know, it's the same thing. Like we had Obama as the president in the United States. He was a Democrat. Guess what? All the Democrats were in the White The people who were on Obama's side, the Democrats, were in the White House. They were on his staff. Donald Trump comes in. He's president. 
A Republican is president. Guess what? He gets rid of Obama's people. He puts his people in the White House. Well, that's what Jesus is going to do. He's going to say to Satan's people, you're out of here. You're not, you don't have any part of me. And he says, I'm going to put my people in. Here are my 12 apostles. They're going to sit on 12 thrones. And look at what I'll give them. Verse 29, Matthew 19, 29. And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. In verse 27, Peter says, I don't have health, I don't have wealth. What am I going to get? And in verse 29, Jesus says, you're going to get health, and you're going to get wealth. But you're not going to get it now, because Satan is the god of this world. But when the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns on this earth, then you will have a hundredfold what you gave up for my name's sake. So the health and wealth of believers is not right now. We've seen that from 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 4, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Corinthians 11 and 12, 1 Peter 4, many other passages we could give to show that you do not get wealthy serving God when Satan is over this world. But when the Lord Jesus Christ rules and reigns, then his people get the wealth. Look over in Revelation 22, and you can see during that reign, uh, the Gentiles, because remember 3 John is written to the Gentiles, they will go up to Jerusalem to worship the Lord there before his throne. And in Revelation 22, it says in verse 1, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Remember, Jesus Christ's throne is on the earth. So he sees this coming out from the earth over in Ezekiel. He says, The water of the river of life flowing from the throne. First it's up to my ankles, and it's up to my knees, and it's up to my waist, it's over my head. The water is just, in other words, it's an idea of, He's not saying you're going to drown in the kingdom. It's saying that the idea is that you're prosperous. There's life and water and there's just great prosperity. And he says in verse 2, In the midst of the street of it and of either side of the river was there the tree of life which, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And notice this last part. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. The nations are the Gentiles. So Gaius is a believing Gentile. And so when John says in 3 John 2, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth, the reason he says that is because in the millennial reign, the Lord Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning over the earth. If, he, if Gaius is sick, then he is to go to Jerusalem and eat of the leaves of the tree of life, and then he will be healed. That's what we just read in Revelation 22. If Gaius is an unbelief, then he will not go to Jerusalem as he's commanded to do three, at least three times per year. The males, Deuteronomy 16.16 16 says, the males shall appear before the Lord uh, three times a year. And over in Isaiah 66, you have them appear before uh, the Lord as well in that kingdom. If he goes to the Lord there, then he's eating of the leaves and he's healthy. If he goes to the Lord, he's bringing him gifts like the Queen of Sheba did with the King of Solomon. And the reason he's able to bring gifts is the Lord prospers him. I mean, if you've got a piece of land that you own and you give it over to somebody to, to work it for you, you get of the goods of that, uh, but that person that works it gets to keep some as well. And so that person, the Lord Jesus Christ, gives that land over. The person works it. They bring riches of the Gentiles. It says in Isaiah 61, 6, that Israel, believing Israel, shall eat of the riches of the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles are bringing those riches up to Jerusalem in the kingdom. Well, if he's got riches, obviously, he must be wealthy as well. Gaius must be wealthy in order for him to give gifts. If he doesn't have any, you know, if you go to church and they say, well, why didn't you give a tithe? and you say, I don't have a job, I don't have any money, then the answer is, that's a good reason for not giving a tithe. Because you did tithe. You tithed nothing. And you gave 10% of nothing, which is nothing. But if you've got a lot, and you give 10%, then you must have 90%. You have a lot left as well. By the way, I think it's going to be an 80% that they get to keep because the tithe under Joseph in the book of Genesis was a 20% that they gave to the Pharaoh so I think 
what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom is the Gentiles, the land is going to prosper, it's going to flow with milk and honey, and Gaius is going to keep 80% of it, and then he's going to take 20% up to Jerusalem. Uh, that's my guess based upon what happened under Joseph in Egypt. But anyway, either way, it shows that he is wealthy and healthy, not because he gave C.A. Dollar all his money, but because he's in the millennial kingdom and the Lord Jesus Christ is, is the God of this world. And he is prospering and blessing Gaius because Gaius believes Jesus Christ. His soul prospers, verse 2 says, and so then his health and wealth is there too. And that's why John says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health. Because if he does not prosper and be in health, then what that means is Gaius is not going to Jerusalem. He's not bringing his goods. I mean, Jesus Christ can just strike that land with famine if they are not obeying him. He rules with a rod of iron. He will do that for the unbelievers. And so the reason John says, I wish above all things that thou mayest have prosper and be in health is because he realizes that if Gaius is doing that, then he is following the course of the world. And the course of the world for the millennial reign is doing what Jesus tells him to do. So health and wealth gospel is a very good gospel, but it's for the wrong dispensation. It's not for today. It's for the millennial reign. Gentiles in the millennial reign should listen to what C.A. Dollar says. Give of your money, but don't give it to him. Give it to Jesus. You can give it directly to him. Many people say, well, I gave my 10% to God. I gave it to C.A. Dollar. He's not God. Give it to God himself. So that's what they do in the millennial reign. So the health and wealth gospel, they use this, try to apply it to this dispensation. It's just a pyramid scheme for people like C.A. Dollar to get rich. Uh, what it means, though, in the millennial reign, it makes perfect sense. It, does not contra it contradicts 1 Corinthians and those other passages, but that's because they're in a different dispensation. When Jesus Christ is ruling and your soul prospers under Jesus Christ, then you get health and wealth. But when Satan is ruling this world and your soul prospers under Jesus Christ, you get empty pockets and not good health. Generally speaking, that's how it happens. Okay, so that was verse 2. Okay, so uh, going back to 3 John, verse 1, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Okay, a couple of uh, definitions there I wanted to get in place. And we've already talked about this a little already. When he says the brethren, what I think is happening is that, as I mentioned from verse 9, uh, there must have been some trouble in the church. Diotrophes was leading. He had the preeminence. John heard about it, so he writes a letter. He sends that letter to them. There's no response. Diotrophes, file 13, threw it in the trash, and he continues to rule. And so then John sends some brethren down there, meaning believe in Israel. Israel is supposed to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles. Exodus 19, let's read that. Everybody watching this video should be familiar with this, but if people who haven't watched me before uh, are not familiar with how it works in the Millennial Kingdom. In Exodus 19, verse 5, Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So Israel is to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, to reconcile the Gentiles back to God, and that's what they do during the millennial reign. Uh, let me read Isaiah 61 as well. I alluded to that earlier. We are talking about them bringing their wealth to Jerusalem, that 20%. Um, let's read this one so you know where I'm talking about there. Uh, let's look in verse uh, 5, Isaiah 61, 5. Uh, it's interesting, verses 1 and 2, those are quoted by Jesus Christ at His first coming. Verse 1, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then He closes the book at that point. 
and the, and the Gospel of Luke. And Jesus says there in Luke 4, he says, This day, this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Well, then the rest of that passage takes place at his second coming. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all them that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So there is the second coming. Satan in a bottomless pit, Jesus Christ, the God of this world. That's why believers are now prospering, whereas before they were captives, they were prisoners. Verse 4, And they shall build the old wastes, they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. That's the Gentiles. The Gentiles have come to Jerusalem to feed the flocks. They're their servants. And the sons of the alien. We're not talking about little green men, but we're talking about illegal, well, not illegal aliens, legal aliens, people from other nations, shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers. Verse 6, But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. What we read in Exodus 19, 5 and 6, that they will be a kingdom of priests. But ye shall be named the priest of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. That's that 20% that they bring in from their crops. And in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. So there again, uh, Israel, that kingdom of priests, and eating of the riches of the Gentiles. So what I think happens in 3 John, going back there, is because Israel is that kingdom of priests to reconcile the earth back to God, they go out to Gentile churches, or they go out to those who uh, would believe and obey God. And they start forming these churches, and they try to get the Gentiles to believe God, follow what Jesus Christ says, to obey the Mosaic Law. That's what he's going to be preaching or uh, giving at that time. And so, the brethren there in 3 John 3 would be believing Israel, part of that kingdom of priests that have gone out to the Gentile, to the Gentiles. And then my children in 3 John verse 4, that would be the believing Gentiles. The brethren are brothers with John. They are Jews. They are part of believing Israel, the saved, program, the saved Israel in Israel's program. But then my children would be those who grow up from them. The ones in Zechariah 8.23, when ten men of the Gentiles take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, we will go with you for we have heard God is with you. That would be their children. I mean, if you've got, if you've got a woman and there's a child holding on to her skirt, chances are that's her child, or at least that child is in her care. If not, there's something weird going on there. Um, so when ten men of the, of the Gentiles take hold of the skirt of the one who is a Jew and say, we will go with you, it's like they are their father or their mother. They're the one, spiritually speaking, the Gentiles are their children. So when verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth, that would be a reference to those believing Gentiles in the millennial reign. And uh, another way to see this in terms of my children, we were over in Isaiah. Go over to Isaiah chapter 49. Look at Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah 49, um, you've got in verse 1, God is calling to Israel during the fifth cycle of chastisement. It says, listen, O isles unto me. Isles is a type of the Gentiles in the, in the Bible. So he's talking to the isles, but he says, And hearking ye people from afar, the Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. And you go down to verse 3, it says, He said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So he's talking to Israel, but he's talking to the isles because Israel is scattered among the heathen. So Isaiah 49 is a fifth cycle of chastisement, nation of Israel passage. With that in mind, look in verse 18. Isaiah 49, 18. Lift up thine eyes round about, and behold... All these gather themselves together and come to thee. As I live, saith the Lord, thou shalt surely 
clothe thee with them all as with an ornament and bind them on thee as a bride doeth. In other words, what he's saying is Israel is going to be restored. If you look in verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. So you see in verse 1 and 2, Israel scattered among the Gentiles in the fifth cycle of chastisement. Verse 8, you see the, um, the gathering together of Israel. Verse 13, Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy unto his, upon his afflicted. So you see, you see Israel gathered together now in the kingdom. And uh, so he tells him in verse 18, to lift up thine eyes round about and behold, you've got children now. He says, not only have I saved you from among the heathen and I brought you into your own land, but now you've got children of your own. You've got Gentiles following you in the Lord, he says. Verse 19, for thy waste and thy desolate places and the land of thy destruction shall even now be too narrow by reason of the inhabitants and they that swallowed thee up shall be far away. The children, they're in hell. The children which thou shalt have. The children with that which thou shalt have there. Reference to the Gentiles being saved in that millennial kingdom. After thou hast lost the other, that's the ones that they didn't have because of their unbelief before the second coming of Christ. Shall again, shall say again in thine ears, the place is too straight for me. Give place to me that I may dwell. Verse 21. Then shalt thou say in thine heart, Who hast begotten me these? Seeing I have lost my children, and am desolate, a captive, and removing to and fro. And who hath brought up these? Behold, I was left alone. These, where have they been? Where have they been? Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles, and set up my standard to the people. And they shall bring thy sons in their arms, and thy daughters shall be carried upon their shoulders. And the kings and kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and their queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their face toward the earth and look up the dust in thy feet and thou shalt know that I am the Lord for they shall not be ashamed that wait for me. So you see there Israel scattered among the heathen. Fifth cycle of chastisement. Verse 1 and 2. Verse 8, God saves them. Verse 13, the heavens sing because the earth is being reconciled back to God. And now verse 20 and 21, there are children from the kingdom of Israel, those Gentiles, and you see them coming in verse 22. The Gentiles coming, and even the prominent ones, the kings and queens, and they're bowing down to Israel because they're ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. So you see from that passage there, children, uh, in reference to Israel being uh, the Gentiles in the millennial kingdom called that. So in Third John now, when he says there in verse 3... <coughs> And verse 4, hopefully we can understand what these verses mean now. So when he says in 3 John 3, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came, so that would be believing Israel as that kingdom of priests who went to the Gentiles. Then they came back to John, and they testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. So you see Isaiah 49 being fulfilled. That the Gentiles are obeying God because Israel has been that kingdom priest in the millennial reign and they've went out and shared God's law with them. And so then John says in verse 4, as the elder, as one sitting on those 12 thrones and where the earth was oppressed and in unbelief for 6,000 plus years during Satan being the God of this world, John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. No greater joy, because that means God is reconciling the earth back to himself through the nation of Israel, because the children, Gentiles, believing Gentiles, coming in with Israel. And then verse 5, he said, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. So he's talking about Gaius there in verse 1. He was well beloved. He says, contrary to Diotrephus, that uh, Gaius has been faithful. And when the believing Israel came to see them, the kingdom of priests came to them to see if they're walking in the truth or not, um, he was faithful to them. He uh, received them in. He took care of them. Uh, if you look over in Matthew 10, 
Now you say, well, why do you have to take care of them? I mean, Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. Why not? Well, when Jesus sends people out, he doesn't send them out with a lot of provisions because then it gives the people that they're sent out to an opportunity to bless them. You see in verse 5, in Matthew 10, 5, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in the at hand phase of the kingdom, believing remnant is to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And when they go, verse 9, it says, Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. So in other words, you go in there and you give the lost sheep of the house of Israel the opportunity to bless you or not. They can, uh, if you bring two coats, they'll say, well, let me help you out. Let me give you some clothing. Let me give you some food. And you say, oh, no, I got enough. I got it myself. But if they don't take anything with them, then you can see what they'll do. Say, where'd you come from? You have any place to stay tonight? No. Well, if they're unbelievers, they're going to say, okay, well, you better leave now. Go on and find some place to stay. But if they're believers, they'll say, I want to help out these people. I'll give them a place to stay. I'll give them clothes to wear. I'll give them food to eat. It gives them the opportunity to help them out. And so in the kingdom, in the millennial reign, Jesus Christ is going to send the kingdom of priests out to the Gentiles, just like he sent them out to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Matthew 10. They'll say, don't bring gold or silver or brass or script for your journey or two coats or shoes. The workman is worthy of his meat. So you go and you'll find a place that will accept you and they'll take care of you. And then that will give the Gentiles the opportunity to bless Israel so that they may be rewarded in the kingdom as well. And so that's what Gaius has done. In 3 John 5, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren. The brethren had came to him with no food or shelter or money or anything. And Gaius says, You are of God, and we're thankful that you came to help us so that we can serve the Lord Jesus Christ who is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. So we're going to do what we can do materially to help you. You are a workman for God and you are worthy of meat. I am going to help you. And so that's what Gaius did. He did faithfully to them. And then he also helped strangers. And I would take that to mean other Gentiles who are not part of that church who had heard that God is, you know, in, of course they know that God is ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And they've heard that this kingdom of priests, uh, Israel, has come to them. And they said, well, we want to hear about God. We want to know how to serve him. And so they come to the church, and Gaius helps them as well. So Gaius then uh, is showing that he is of God and a believer by the fact that he has helped believe in Israel and also these strangers or those Gentiles that have come to him. And then from verse 6, we see that they have borne wit um, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. So the brethren had come back to John, as evidenced by the fact, verse 3 says, that the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. So when they talked about the truth, they also, in verse 6, bore witness of thy charity before the church. They bore witness that Gaius was showing God's love to believe in Israel as they came to them as that kingdom of priests. And so then he says there, so the church there, uh, when it says before the church, I believe that's a reference to the believing Israel in Jerusalem. In other words, those brethren who came from John have now come back to John, and there's the church in Israel there, the believing Israel, and they have told to the church there that Gaius is uh, showing God's love to us. He is a believer. We need to help them out. So that's why John sends the letter. He says, let's get that church straight then. We can't. Diotrophes did much harm, but we are going to uh, get things back on track due to Gaius there uh, now being that well-beloved. And we've also got Demetrius as well. So um, the charity of Gaius has been shown to believing Israel in Jerusalem, and they bore witness of it. And so what uh, John is saying then, so then uh, John writes this letter, and he writes you know these things. Well, obviously... To get the letter to 
Gaius and to them, he sent the brethren back out. So the brethren had come, and then they went back to John and gave a good report of Gaius and said, this Diotrophes is causing all the trouble. Well, we've got Demetrius, we've got Gaius, we've got some people there that are believers. Um, they want to hear, they want to believe, so uh, let's help them out. And so John says, great. So he writes a small letter of instruction, gives it back to the brethren, says, okay, deliver that letter to this Gentile church. And so then he says, so that's so the brethren are back there because they had to give the letter. And so then Gaius reads it, and in part of that letter he says, in verse 6, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. So, and, so what he's basically saying is, that, uh, as we've said before, look over in Isaiah 66. In the millennial reign, all of the Gentiles, at least the believing Gentiles, uh, and we'll get more into detail of this when we get toward the end of 3 John, they come up to Jerusalem. Uh, let me read you, I'll read you Deuteronomy 16, 16, and then we'll read Isaiah 66. Under the Mosaic Law, which is what the Gentiles are following in the millennial reign, Deuteronomy 16.16 16 says, Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, which ends up being Jerusalem. And here are the three times they come. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. So it shows that Israel, under the Mosaic Law, is to appear before the Lord's temple there in Jerusalem. <coughs> so then the Gentiles, since they also are following God's law in the millennial reign, uh, they are to do that as well. Uh, I don't think, although I do think they do appear those three times, uh, if you read Isaiah 66, it doesn't mention that. It says they're coming all the time. And that just may be some logistical purpose. I mean, if you've got four billion people and they all have to come to Jerusalem, uh, you know, look at the journeys of Mecca in uh, Islam. They have to be in Mecca at a certain time of the year for a certain three days, and it's just packed. Well, can you imagine if God says to four billion people, all the men of the entire world need to come into Jerusalem at the same time? Um, you know, it's going to be pretty crowded. So maybe uh, it's not exactly like that. Maybe it's still three times, but it may not be Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Weeks, uh, those types of things. Because when you read in Isaiah 66, verse 22, talking about that time after Jesus' second coming and the Lord Jesus Christ ruling and reigning God's kingdom on earth there in Jerusalem, it says Isaiah 66, 22, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. So they're all going. It doesn't just say in those three feasts, but you see in the new moon and the Sabbath. So it could just be a logistical purpose, or it could be the fact that he's God and he can prosper everybody and he can come every week. I don't know exactly how it works. But the point is that all the Gentiles who believe God will be coming to Jerusalem during that time. If they don't believe God, you may ask about them. I think after a hundred years of disobedience, they are, uh, they are thrown into hell. You see from Isaiah 65, verse 20. Isaiah 65, verse 19. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. So that's a reference to Jesus Christ ruling on the throne, because as long as Satan is the God of this world, there will be crying. Verse 20. There shall be no more offense in infinite days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. So I think what you're finding out there is that God gives all the Gentiles a hundred year grace period. And if they continue to rebel, they don't go up to the mountain, they don't learn God's law, they don't obey, then after a hundred years they will be accursed. They will be destroyed and cast into hell. And you see that from verse 24 of chapter 66, the very last verse in Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 24, because when the people come up to worship the Lord in verse 23, 
Verse 24 says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. Well, the worm dying not and the fire uh, not being quenched, Jesus refers to that over in Mark uh, chapter 9. Mark 9, verse 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48. All of those verses individually mention about hell and the fire and the worm dying not and the fire not being quenched. So when you see that in Isaiah 66, 24, that's a reference to them being thrown to hell. So um, what it tells you then in the millennial reign, all believers are going to go up and appear before the Lord in Jerusalem. And all unbelievers have a hundred year time to get things right. And if they don't, then they're going to be destroyed and cast into hell. And then all the people who are going up to Jerusalem will see those down in hell. And that will be a very strong incentive for them to obey the Lord. When you see them suffering, when their worm dieth not, that means this beautiful flesh. I mean, you may think I'm absolutely gorgeous, but when that flesh is taken off and it's just down to a worm, I'll look downright ugly like that uh, when that flesh is burned off. And you see those worms just down, down there and then pouring and uh, uh, pouring unto all flesh. Like I say, when you look at me, you're not really a pour. You, most people aren't. Some are. Uh, most people aren't. But if you looked at the worm and in my... If I didn't have Christ and I wasn't saved, I mean, what I really am on the inside, just a worm is all I am. And it would just be an abhorring to see all those worms down there and they're struggling in anguish and torment. And you're going up before the Lord and you recognize that if you don't keep doing this and keep worshiping God, you're going to be like that worm. You're going to lose your beautiful body and you're going to be down there and you're going to be an abhorring unto all flesh. Pretty strong incentive for you to go up to Jerusalem. So I mention all that. Because since Gaius, going back to 3 John, is a believer, his soul prospers in verse 2. Well, then he's got health and wealth because he keeps going up to Jerusalem because that's what the Lord has told him to do. So since he's going to go up to Jerusalem anyway, and there's believing Israel there in his church that has come from Israel to, uh, from John, from Jerusalem to Gaius, where he is in that Gentile church, wherever it is, and Gaius is going to go up to Jerusalem anyway. Then John tells him in 3 John 6, Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. So in other words, I've already sent the brethren. They've seen that you're doing good. You have a problem guy in Diotrophes, but Gaius and Demetrius are doing good. And so I'm sending this letter to help out the church. And we've seen your charity and we've seen you walking in the truth. So now, when you come up here next time, come with the brethren. And we can basically rejoice in front of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ over how He has changed you and how He has given you health and wealth and you're prospering in His kingdom. And let's just rejoice over the transformation that has taken place in your lives. That even though you had diatrophies and you had some unbelief in that church, that you are more than conquerors through the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, bring them up with you. And you can see also the fact that he says, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort. I wrote on your outline, after a godly sort shows that Israel is fulfilling the great commission. We already talked about them being a kingdom of priests. And what they're doing is what it says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20. People today try to fulfill this. They're in the wrong dispensation. This is for the millennial reign. He says in Matthew 28, 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So God has commanded them to do this, and they do it in the millennial reign. Therefore, believing Israel's journey is after a godly sort. All right, so verse 6, We which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Uh, we're out of time, so we'll just stop right there, and we'll start, pick up in verse 7. We may even finish um, next time. We'll see. Let's close in a word of prayer. 
Uh, dear Lord, we just rejoice over what your kingdom is going to be as we see the health and wealth and all the wonder of that kingdom in the millennial reign. And we pray that we just set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Not get caught up in trying to get that health and wealth right now, recognizing that we're under Satan as the course of this world and just allowing Christ to live in us. And as they crucified Christ and he suffered, so we will suffer as well for living godly. Help us to have that otherworldly perspective so that Christ may live in us to believe your word and not believe what man says uh, so others may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thanks for joining us. And next time we'll pick up in verse 7 in 3 John. So we'll see you then.